Druvit Moy Druzi. Hello, my friends. My name is Darren Gertis. I'm a professor who tries to help you understand context in relation to the war in Ukraine. So yesterday I posted a video where I showed how pro-Ukrainian YouTubers were talking about how, how they understood Putin and Putin's trip and why he was doing things. And so, and I got a lot of comments about it that said, well, you need to talk about this one and this YouTuber and that YouTuber. Okay. So what I'm going to do is a couple of things here. I'm going to show you a list that viewers on my channel have crowdsourced about pro-Ukrainian YouTubers. And then I'm going to make it accessible to you uh, before the end of this video. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to also show you, now I can't cover everyone. There's about 90 on this list that are pretty approved and pretty awesome. And I'm gonna go over maybe 10 or so of the top and then what you see in the color coding is, if it's dark color coding, this is like the top 20 that I personally would recommend and say, go, go watch these channels if you're not already. But we're gonna start here, and this is an oversimplification, but there's basically three different camps of pro-Ukrainian or what I call UA tubers, okay? So there's First, the military type of analysis type of YouTube channel, and that could be broken down in two different ways. The first one is somebody that's just covering the battle maps and what's going on on the ground, who's fighting who and where. But then there's a second type of military channel where it's like Combat Veteran Reacts, and I'm going to show you a little clip of him today. And he actually has combat experience, and he can break things down in a way that will just open up a world of understanding about what he means and how this happened and why this happened that way and not that way. Okay, then there's a second group, and the second group I'll call academic for lack of a better term. Now, academic doesn't just mean academic like me. It could be anybody dealing with the geopolitical space or something along those lines. And then there's a third camp, and I would call that cultural. Cultural means that they're a big part of why we watch them is because, for example, Anna from Ukraine lives in Ukraine. Dennis Davdov lives in Ukraine. And so Dennis occupies two different spaces. He does the battle maps and he also lives in Ukraine. So I'm going to show you some clips of about 10 YouTubers and we're going to get a good sense of who they are and how they operate. Now first we're going to start with Jake Bro. Jake is like one of the best YouTubers out there. He has a great handle on what's going on. He his both credentialed in the uh, military space. He was a former missileer in the United States Air Force. And before this, he was doing some financial kind of trading and that kind of thing. So he has a real good sense about what's going on like financially within those kinds of systems. Um, and he tries to cover current events daily. And he's the guy that brought Donbass Davushka to my attention. And now that amazed me because I spend my time reading legitimate news sources and I hadn't heard of her before he talked about it. So my whole shtick is that I triangulate on Western news sources. I even read RT and Pravda. And what I try to do is try to bring some sense making and context to viewers. I'm not trying to cover everything like some people, but I am trying to help you think about things in a more refined, nuanced way. Now let's watch Jake talk about the Donbass Davushka for a little bit. She's the link between uh, Jack Teixeira and getting this information that Jack leaked out spread on the internet. But she likes the attention. Ultimately, I think that that's what this is all about. I don't think she actually believes in Russia or supports Russia. She just likes the attention she was getting from Z supporters on the internet. And ultimately what caught her, how NAFO pieced it together, was she participated in podcasts about tropical fish. I'll link this video down below. It's an hour-long podcast in which she's promoting her tropical fish business, Cascadia Aquatics. <laughs> and I even found a Cascadia Aquatics unboxing video on YouTube, and there it is, Sarah Bills, Cascadia Aquatics. That's pretty amazing that he did now, that. Now, Sarah Bills did uh, shut down her store on Shopify. She deleted her account on Twitter, deleted her account on Instagram. But Sarah, everything on the internet is forever. Yep. There's a website, Internet Archive Wayback Machine, and I can go back in time and see what her fish store website looked like in February of 2022. If I scroll to the bottom, 
Sure enough, it says she's based in Whidbey Island, Washington, where she was stationed while serving in the United States Navy. And this website, guys, this is from February 25th of 2022. So what happened was, as a side hustle, she was selling fish food uh, to tropical pet enthusiasts. And when Russia invaded Ukraine, she just decided she didn't want to do this anymore. And she went all in on being a Russian propagandist in order to scam people for money. That's insane. Now, that's not just insane, but it's a really interesting transition piece because a lot of these YouTubers, that UA tubers, as I call them, a lot of us were doing something else before we started doing this. Tw uh, February 24th came along and we started going, whoa, what's going on? I immediately, um, second day, I, I was shocked in the first day, so by the second or third day when I heard Zelensky say, I need ammunition, not a ride, I went, what do you say? Wow, I got to know everything I can about him. And in three weeks, I wrote an ebook that was on Amazon about Zelensky, and then I updated it faithfully for the next four or five months, up through Serverdonesk and Lusichance. And then I was thinking to myself at the time, like, how do I, how do I do more? How do I do something more useful? And by this point, I thought, you know what? If I could, I'm updating this stuff anyway, about day 85, I'm updating this anyway. Why don't I put it on YouTube so that people can see it? And that was my journey. Jake was uh, doing uh, these financial podcasts or financial videos, and he was doing. He was very successful in that, and he pivoted. Dennis Davdoff, who we're going to see a little bit later, he was. Uh, he's a pilot who was doing these. Uh, videos about traveling and motorcycles and whatever, and then he pivoted. So she pivoted from her business just for gain, just trying to graft off of Russian and, and you know pretend that she is Russian so that she could uh, make money on uh, on the backs of the this tragic event. And over the last year, she's recorded dozens of podcasts with all of the biggest propagandists uh, for Russia on on social media. Gonzo Lira, Scott Ritter numerous times, Jimmy Dore, the guys from the Duran, and in all of these podcasts, she was using a fake, a really bad fake Russian accent. So now, I, I don't want to say that she was just, that's, that might not be quite fair. It might not have been just because she was trying to get money. That's actually the best face you can put on it. Maybe she really believed that, which is a little bit worse. Okay, so that's Jake analyzing what's going on, doing some deep digging, and if you don't watch Jake Bro, watch Jake Bro. I mean, this isn't hard. Just watch him as well. Like You should be watching Jake Bro. Okay, let's go on to the next one. So now this is a tippling philosopher. His name is Johnny Pierce. Johnny and I have done a collaboration together. He's a good guy. Um, he does a lot of like daily updates of what's going on, including battle mats. But, but here's what he does. Now, he's he's a real philosopher. He's a legit philosopher. And so he's going to be kind of in the, uh, you know, academic kind of space. And But he still, he brings a wealth of understanding to his topic. Here he is adding to what Jake has done. And Johnny is a Brit who is giving that British perspective, and I appreciate getting, you know, and part of this is getting multiple perspectives so you can triangulate on what is true. So here we go. Um, that, that kind of builds on this, uh, you know, Malcontent News was a first report on Ms. Uh, Ms. Bills's alter ego and was able to verify the self-declared Russian Jew Donbass Maiden was actually born in Voorhees, New Jersey, according to her 2011 marriage. Yeah, that's somewhere down near Philadelphia. I'm, I grew up in New Jersey and I understand the, the lay of the land. It's, it's uh, so in New Jersey, you either kind of are New York centric, which is where I was. I was about 20 miles outside New York City or Philadelphia centric. And she grew up about 20 miles outside of Philadelphia. So it continues. An investigation by Bellingcat traced the spread of the documents. So this is now going to ver relatively recently. We see mm -hmm. the J uh, Jack uh, Tejera documents that came out. And he was a 21 year old who uh, was leaking all these documents for his own self-aggrandizement. You know, that wasn't actually um, a, a case of being a whistleblower, as, as some people like to see. This was some guy just leaking stuff to make himself, you know, king amongst his his friends. The one-eyed man is king amongst the blind, uh, and so on. But um, he he 
uh, released these documents and she was the first person that's been known to have circulated the the tampered documents the ones with the fake russian statistics so as the article continues uh, Bellingcat traced the spread of the documents from Tajira's Discord to 4chan, Telegram and Twitter. Dueling versions of key documents were circulating with one showing Russian losses far exceeded Ukrainian losses and the other poorly edited version showing the opposite. Bellingcat alleges the doctored versions originated on a Donbass Davushka Telegram channel, a claim Bills denies. However, it was the first place that these uh, documents were found. Tucker Carlson, the far-right U.S. Tele uh, television propagandist, used the edited version distributed by her Telegram channel. On April the 13th, the broadcast of his Fox News show, Tucker Carlson Tonight, he claimed that Ukraine was suffering a 7-to-1 troop loss ratio and was, quote, losing the war. Carlson's show reaches approximately 3.25 million view viewers per night, a reach that could sway U.S. public support for Ukraine. Carlson now, it's not just him, but so... So what he's just explained, and Jake has talked about this as well, is that Don Bashtavuska apparently was the one doctoring the uh, the documents, the leaked documents, and we don't know that for sure. It could have been Russians doing that, whatever. But then that gets out on Fox News, and it gets out in other places. Now it's not just what happened there. This spread everywhere through all the Russian, pro-Russian YouTubers as well. So this is Scott Ritter. Scott Ritter and Colonel McGregor are two of the most powerful voices on the other side of the equation talking about Ukraine. Now, he is on Judge Napolitano's show, Judging Freedom, and this is what they had to say about using those same numbers. And this was a video on my website that you can see from about a week ago. Uh, among other revelations in the document is something uh, you talked about. I don't know, I don't remember if you used these numbers. The numbers are startling. And that is the kill ratio, 7 to 1. As I understand that, it would mean that the Russians kill 7 Ukrainian soldiers or, or military forces uh, for every one Russian that the Ukrainians kill. If yeah. that that was from the doctor number, so I mean that's obviously bizarrely wrong. That number is true. Do the math. How much longer can this last? And again, look at the the, the assumptions that Napolitano comes to here. Like, wow, it, over of course Russia is winning. Uh, seven to one kill ratio is not sustainable kill ratio, especially when the seven is to the nation with a smaller uh, population uh, and smaller. Uh, defense base. Uh, Russia is a bigger country, has more defense uh, production capacity, um, and so a 7 to 1 kill ratio uh, where the Russians are killing 7 Ukrainians to 1 Russian is a uh, uh, just an unsustainable ratio. This, this and if that were true, that that's what was going on, then he'd be right. But he's also missing something. Russia's a bigger country than Ukraine, but not than NATO. And <laughs> it's NATO backing Ukraine's play. And so it's a very different picture. War can't last much longer. I mean, this is a slaughter, or as one of my, uh, one of our, our writers, one of our commenters, the people that email us during the show, uh, said a turkey shoot. I mean, this this is just an overwhelming imbalance, is it not? It is. I mean, during World War II and some of the large scale fighting that took place on Europe, uh, you know, the 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 victor. Uh, you, you generally see a one to one point two, one to one point three kill ratio. Uh, so the victors winning on the margins, meaning that they're, they're grinding them down and then in the end uh, you know, they, they, they happen to kill a fraction more than they're being killed and so they achieve an advantage. Uh, a 7 to 1 advantage is just mind-boggling. Well, uh, it's mind-boggling that they're still talking about this because this is the document that's been doctored or clearly seems to have been doctored, but they keep talking about it. Now, the really tragic thing here is that talking about it like this is what's actually happened when Judge Napolitano has 135,000 subscribers, and when you look at this, there's 104,000 views of this. It was only streamed eight hours ago. 104,000 people have already seen them talk this nonsense. And while it's a little bit weird for me to be commenting on myself, that's the tragedy here, is that 100,000 people saw this within eight hours, This the doctored numbers. But the doctored numbers, it appears, comes from Donbass Davushka, uh, Miss Bills, 
who got it from Jack Chikshera, who was just stupid, but this is the chain of events. Okay, so that's to give you kind of a sense of like how different YouTubers bring things into play, right? Uh, let's let's continue here and let's talk about shift gears a little bit. Another great channel to watch is 1420. 1420 is just a channel where he asks average men on the street interviews, like, what do you think about this? And so here he's asking about, um, well, what do you think about uh, the U.S. has a much better economy? Why do you think that that is? And he asks Russians. Now, a lot of Russians demure from that. I don't want to get political, which is really interesting. We just talked yesterday about this, where I highlighted a debate between Anders Puck Nielsen on one hand saying they're apolitical and they're going to become more political over time. Just go back one video and you'll see what I'm talking about. They'll become more political over time as they get called up for military service. That's what Anders Puck Nielsen was saying. And then Vlad Vexler was saying, no, 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 this being called up, this, you know, it's going to force them to become even more apolitical. But so they have different perspectives and that's okay. Triangulate on their perspectives and hear their voices and then make your decision of how you see what's going on. So listen to these distinct voices. And I'm not highlighting Vlad in this video. I'm not highlighting Anna from Ukraine. I'm not highlighting uh, highlighting uh, Anders Puck, uh, Nielsen or Mercado Media because I talked about them yesterday and I only have so much time. But all of them are worth watching and I watch them. Okay, here is 1420. And this is how people are answering this question of why is America's economy doing better than elsewhere. Now, I'm going to mute and read it because it's in Russian, so most people won't understand it anyway, okay? The U.S. economy was built on the fact that they constantly invaded other countries, and we did not. It's better to have a weaker economy, but at least people won't die. Am I biased, right? With Vietnam, with napalm, a million killed in Iraq, blink, bleeping great. Oil is being pumped in Syria. The Americans themselves are living great. But thanks to Americans outside of America, life is not so great. The Middle East will prove it. Why do you think we can't have the same cunning policies as the states? Because after the collapse of the USSR, we bleeping everything up, and now we just don't have the resources. Our people would love to invade somewhere and siphon off resources. But we don't have the manpower, support, or money to do it. So our people are moving in a neoliberal direction, doing everything according to UN rules. As a matter of fact, only Russia abides by these very UN rules. Like, this guy really believes that, yes, only us. So watch 1420, you'll get a sense of, like, what's going on in Russia. Part of the reason that I listen to different channels, like, I listen to Anna of Ukraine because I want a Ukrainian perspective, or I talk to Oris. I've, I've uh, done interviews with Oris twice, Oris Zub, watch him. Uh, or, like, if I want a Russian perspective, I'll listen to Konstantin, uh, from inside Russia, or I'll listen to Vlad Vexler and, and get that kind of Russian perspective. So you want to triangulate and get different perspectives from different places. Okay, let's talk about more like the battle map kind of thing. Um, I also listen to Dennis Davidov for a Ukrainian perspective. He's actually, I owe, some people don't like Dennis, I like Dennis. I, I owe Dennis a debt because he's the, the YouTuber I started watching first who actually got me to a place where I thought, you know, I could do this. I, I could I could contribute something. Like with my background, I, I focus on leadership kind of issues. So I don't focus on the battle map, but I can bring something to the table. Now, Dennis actually does a really good job in telling us like the context of what's going on on the ground as he talks about the battle map and pronunciation really helped me a lot because my, I, I'm not and I don't claim to be Ukrainian so I slaughtered the language okay let's hear Dennis for a little hello bit. my friends now I remind you that everything that we're watching here was yesterday's video unless I note otherwise okay here we go Firstly, let's go to the south region of Kherson because Russians claim that Ukraine crossed the Dnieper River. The Russian military bloggers claim that and they say that Ukrainian forces regularly cross the river and they have the small camp on the other part of the shore. We call it the Dachi part and it's very close to Antonovsky Bridge that was destroyed by the Russian forces after they left Kherson in just a few hours. So now we have a small camp over there that is unable to go on offensive missions somewhere in this area and as you can see this area is not good for the offensive mainly because there are many rivers, swamps and lakes. Russia got the control over the nearby village Leshki but they cannot go closer to the Dnieper because 
we got the artillery on the other part of the shore so they keep out from the positions of Ukrainian army because they may fear of the losses and the distance from Arleshki to the river is just a little bit less than 5 kilometers. Well, I don't think that it's the first step for Ukrainian counterattack, no, because of this natural obstacles it's just a bad idea to go forward from this place. But to have the military camp on the other part, mostly Russian controlled territory, is kind of the good idea. But there is a better place for the possible counterattack and it is near to Novakohovka. Here you can see there are no any swamps, nothing, and you may use this island to cover the advancement of the troops. Okay, so now I, I, I appreciate what Dennis has done there. He showed me about the, the geography of Ukraine, of that section. He taught me the proper pronunciation, and he helped me understand some things. But he also helped me understand culture, because as a Ukrainian, he thinks like a Ukrainian. So watch this next little bit. And this was really striking to me, and it helped me significantly. Not, not just what he's about to say, but just the attitudes that I picked up about how Ukrainians think differently from Russians. As an American, growing up, I wouldn't have made very much of a distinction between Ukrainians and Russians. But the idea that Ukraine is not Russia, their mentalities are completely different as well. In fact, one of my viewers talked about, his name was Ozzy, he talked about how, you know, Russians are serfs, Ukrainians are Cossacks. And there's a world of difference between those mentalities, and I think he's right. Okay, watch this. And just half an hour ago, it was the big explosion in Belgorod, the Russian Federation. The explosion was very big. This is the hole in the street. You can see it could be the aviation bomb. For sure it's not the drone or something like that or it could be the artillery shell, like peon with more than 200 mm caliber. But the Ukrainian peons are unable to reach Belgrade with our shells. As one of the variants, it could be the aviation bomb that dropped down from the Russian airplane. The explosion was so big that one of the nearby cars went to the roof of the nearby shop. I still don't have the information about the casualties or the wounded people around, but I do not support bombing the civilians, even Russians. Ukraine. Now that was fascinating to me because I, as as much as I can understand the sentiment that yeah, go kill those Russians, like. There is a difference between the Russian and the Ukrainian mentality, and the Ukrainians just have much, in my estimation, in my understanding, from my observation over the last year plus, they just have a, a much more refined sense of justice and humanity than uh, what what you tend to see from the Russian side. Okay, now if you only have five minutes to watch a battle map update, I would highly recommend reporting from Ukraine. Reporting from Ukraine does a very good job. Uh, I know the guy, I, I appreciate him. He's given me a shout out before when, when I was early on. I, I, I only had like 600 viewers and he gave me a shout out and uh, and a lot of viewers came over to, to see me because of that. So I, I owe him a debt. He does a great job. Now, I'm only showing you people that I think are um, telling truth. Uh, they're not overdoing it or overselling it. Like, because there are some YouTuber, uh, Ukrainian, pro Ukrainian YouTubers that are like, we're going to win. Putin's finished. It's like, like, no, don't be hyperbolic. I want to actually know what's going on. Okay. And he does a good job. Watch it. Watch Today how he does the battle map. From the east. Here, the longer the battle for Bakhmut goes, the heavier both parties start relying on artillery support. As artillery proved to be extremely influential in stopping the enemy and also generating breakthroughs, both Russians and Ukrainians started conducting intense counter-battery operations. Russians quickly realized that they had big problems, because not only is most of the Western artillery is out of their range, but Ukrainians also upgraded their armor and neutralized the threat of the most prevalent Russian counter-battery weapon. Last time at now, I don't know that he has a military background, but he clearly has good, solid information, and he draws out, he paints a picture in about five minutes, maybe seven minutes uh, daily that shows you how this works. So reporting from Ukraine is a great channel I highly recommend. Now, I also recommend Georgie and Ukraine Matters. 
Georgie does a lot of battle map stuff, but he does more than that. I believe he has a master's degree, and he, so he's kind of like the uh, all three of these. Um, he does he does what's going on on the ground. Uh, he's culturally he's a European, um, and he is married to a Ukrainian. So he he gets emotional about this because this really matters to him. Ukraine does matter. Now here's Georgie giving you his take on what he sees with the beginning of a counteroffensive. I tell you everything that is wrong with Ukrainian counteroffensive. And why I think that everyone who is telling you that the counteroffensive has begun are wrong. Hey everyone, Georgie here with Ukraine Matters. Please, 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 no rotten tomatoes. This is not a clickbait. Uh, let me explain. So what happened? Well, a couple of days ago, uh, Deputy Minister of Defense of Ukraine, Hanna Maler, has actually announced that counteroffensive has already begun and movements and attacks that we see on the south side of Ukraine that is right now being executed by the Ukrainian armed forces is already part of the counteroffensive. Uh, just let me switch to this camera for a little bit. So these attacks happening on the south side, they technically can be considered as part of a greater counteroffensive plan, yes. However, this channel, we're focusing mostly all around like a layman terms and, and layman understanding like myself. In my perspective, a counteroffensive is action when Russians get their teeth caved in by the fist of Ukrainian armed forces. That's what I... So he's looking for the big show. Okay, now, so if you hear what Dennis is saying and what he's saying, they're saying the same thing, but from different perspectives. I like Georgie. He's a good guy. We've done a collaboration together. Watch Georgie if you haven't watched Georgie. Now, that being said, if you want to get a perspective of someone who was a combat veteran, watch Combat Veteran Reacts. He is uh, going to show you something a little bit different. So here's so what Emily he has just to say. give us some insight into their force structure in Ukraine. I'm Paul, U.S. Army combat veteran. It's April 20th, 2023. This is your daily Ukraine update. Let's get into it. Let's take a look at the control map. Um, as you guys can see, it says minor frontline updates, but again, I would not consider this advance in Bakhmut to be minor, uh, simply because it represents that Russian forces have advanced beyond this central rail line, demarcating central Bakhmut from western Bakhmut, meaning that Ukrainian forces, uh, a natural obstacle, or, you know, natural obstacle, uh, has been cleared, and that Russian forces who have demonstrated a pretty high level of proficiency in taking block by block of this city uh, really have very few obstacles remaining um, in their efforts to take the, the city itself. This is a problem for a couple of reasons. As I've maintained for some time now, um, Bachman itself has lost any strategic value it may have had previously, um, but the most important thing that it does is pin down uh, top tier Wagner forces and top tier airborne forces in one location. But if this battle wraps up, you're going to start to see Russia reallocate those forces and you don't want Russia to reallocate them um, before it, to places where they're going to be used in the defense of uh, against the Ukrainian counteroffensive, right? If if I were a commander, of course, I would probably disperse the VDV in key cities where they can easily, quickly be deployed as a sort of QRF to anywhere on the front lines to patch holes and reinforce positions to prevent breakthroughs by Ukrainian forces. But for now, they are in Bakhmut, pinned and engaged in some pretty heavy fighting. Okay, so you can hear the expertise in combat veteran reacts talking about how to move the airborne forces as a quick reaction force if they are no longer pinned down in, in Bakhmut. Yeah, All right, so if that's the kind of thing that you're looking for, not just the battle map itself, then this is the guy or the kind of source to watch. You can also watch Mercado Media. I talked about him yesterday. He's also a Army veteran and gives a similar kind of perspective. Okay, and then if you want to expand the lens a bit, Perun is a expert, uh, a military expert as well. So I, he's straddles kind of uh, a number of things, geopolitics and some uh, economics and military. And, and he's very much like Anders Puck Nielsen, who I talked about yesterday. So I'm not talking about him as well. Let's hear Now, he doesn't show his face. Um, he just chooses not to. And he does these elaborate PowerPoints that uh, are like an hour, two hours long. And so it depends on what you're trying to get to. Uh, Combat Veteran Reacts is going to be shorter. Mercado is going to be much longer. Uh, so 
you just got to adjust and see what you want to see. Okay. In the country that we previously compromised, call for the overthrow. By the overthrow way, he's it. also from Australia, and so he's going to have yet a different perspective. But here he is just talking about kinetic intervention, like what happened right after the Maidan revolution. The government, after all, it was illegitimately elected and is now massacring its own people. As those calls are happening, a bunch of self-defense forces intended to protect minorities start fighting back. They seize government buildings, critical infrastructure. They're wearing military uniform. They're very well equipped. They move quickly with purpose. But you, a czar, are going to go on camera and say with a straight face that these are absolutely not our pre-positioned special forces elements. From here, the plan could have a couple of outcomes. The intention could be to secure some demarcation line and set that as our objective. Or we could have our allied figures declare themselves legitimate government and then extend to bear land an invitation to send peacekeepers to bring order to the chaos and protect civilians. Having received such an invitation, our troops will cross the border, complete the process of destroying the relatively small military, forcing its surrender and securing the territory. The key here is ambiguity and speed. At any given time, SQL could probably save Nyasto. But the only thing John Smith from South Carolina has ever heard about the place is apparently it's run by a bunch of right-wing extremists that are attacking the minority there and also their elections were fake. There's a moment of confusion as the Allies and their publics try and figure out what on earth has happened and what to do about it. And if the So here he's talking about information war being tied to actual hybrid warfare and, and uh, like war on the ground, information war, propaganda, and all these things being tied together. I always feel like I'm watching, uh, like I'm sitting in class, which is great for me. I'm a professor. I love classes. This is what I do. Um, but so he's, he's a different taste. But if you, if you enjoy this kind of thing, he is the source. Okay, let's continue. Uh, I talked about some others yesterday. I talked about Vlad, Anna, uh, Mercado, and Anders Puck Nielsen, as well as Jake Bro. So I'm not going to go back over that with them as well. But I don't mean to slight anybody. That is not my point. That's not my purpose. Now, I promised you at the beginning that you could have uh, this list that my viewers have crowdsourced about those that we want to see. And you see Anders Puck Nielsen, Anna from Ukraine, Arthur Ray, I didn't mention, but he's awesome. Uh, ATP Geopolitics, I talked about. Combat Veteran Reacts and Dennis Davidoff, I talked about. Jake Bro, we talked about. Mercado was yesterday. Operator Starsky's awesome. You should watch him. Or Zub, I didn't talk about him, but he's awesome. Paul Mazzaro has a lot of insight about Ukraine. He's been there uh, many times. Perun, we just talked about. Professor Gertis explains, that's me. I'm biased. I think he does a good job. Reporting from Ukraine, that is Georgie, uh, who we talked about earlier. Russian dude, he he's Russian, and he gives a Russian perspective, and he's kind of funny, but he's an acquired taste, so somebody will like him, somebody like me will like Vlad, somebody else might like Constantine. Just go and look at it. Silicon Curtain, great interviews with other people uh, that have some perspective of what's going on in Ukraine. Sycamus, Wow. He gives some incredible footage and uh, understanding from a like engineer's kind of point of view, and I'd highly recommend him. Uh, Vlad Yulia, Zach the Russian. Yulia is Ukrainian. Zach the Russian is obviously Russian. And I've highlighted Zach the Russian in previous videos. So now if it's dark green, this means I approve. I watch these. I, I think this is good stuff, safe stuff. You should watch it too. If it's light green, they're, they're probably like a 1420 is in light green. And it's, it's, it's not like I don't watch it, but I only highlighted 20. And these are the 20 that I would say to watch. I'm going to link this. I'm going to pin it in the comments below. And I want you to go and watch some of these. If you do, please do me the favor of giving me a like so that this can spread on YouTube. And if you're new to me and you've not seen me before, please consider subscribing um, because I do these daily updates and I'm trying to help you with provide some context so that you can understand what's happening in Ukraine. Hey, thank you for your time. Thank you for being willing to watch this far. And thank you for being the kind of person that cares about Ukraine.